online because I just got back playing with my uh, with my kids and getting ready for the uh, the festival of lights, which we may be we may be lighting up with fusion powered energy in the near future. So let's see. There's eight people watching. They can hear us. Charles, how are you today, Professor Charles Seif? Of I'm doing well. Thank you very much. Great. You are a rare two-time guest on the Into the Impossible podcast and an audience uh, demand recently, thanks to this novel result released recently from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory up north here in Northern California. And we're going to get into that. Um, and we'll also discuss your book. You were on previously for a wonderful book called Hawking Hawking, which came out in 2021. Uh, it was uh, one of my favorite books of the year. Scientific won many awards, as have many of your books. Uh, and first, maybe you could introduce the fact that you are a journalist, professor, sorry, you were a science journalist, but now you're a journalism professor, as well as a journalist, you still write. Um, what uh, what gives you the so much authority to talk about general relativity, you know, quantum mechanics, and now and also uh, fusion? And what, what does a journalist know? Tell us, Charles. Yeah. Well, journalism's are uh, journalists are meta experts that uh, we we kind of uh, are experts on expertise if we do our jobs right, and so uh, we in some ways assemble a peer review, uh, which. Uh, for the best science journalists can sometimes be more effective and quicker than the peer review um, going through the journals. Uh, I'm not saying necessarily that I'm, I'm the uh, best jury of science, but uh, what we do is very much um, in accord with what good science is. And my background is I, I was training as a mathematician before I was a journalist. So uh, I have, a somewhat unusual skill set within the journalism community. And I've been studying fusion for uh, actually uh, my first job. I actually wrote about fusion uh, when I was at The Economist uh, more than uh, 25 years ago, which kind of terrifies me. So, uh, yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> And then that eventually must have played a, a, a some role in this wonderful book, Sun in a Bottle, <clears throat> S-U-N, uh, in a bottle. Let me see if I can get this to work. I'm trying to do so many things here. I'm going to purchase it accidentally. But Charles, as, as um, it may be new to you, but not to my brilliant audience, I love always love to play a game that you're never supposed to play, which is to judge books by their covers, because uh, what else do you have to go with? But uh, so I'm going to show the cover now. I'm not going to be able to have the animation. I have this custom made bespoke animation with a judge hitting a gavel. Anyway, Charles, you'll watch that some other time and we'll, maybe we'll edit it in at some point. I'm going to share the cover. There it is right up now. I'm showing it. You can buy it. it makes a wonderful Hanukkah present. And this uh, darkest day of the year, happy solstice to you, my winter listeners, and also to my friends at the South Pole uh, celebrating uh, the first day of summer. So, uh, Charles, describe the image that my audience is now seeing. There's three circles, uh, there seems to be a person, and the title uh, and the subtitle is the most provocative aspect of this book to me. Describe this title and book and let us judge it. Well, there's, there's two versions of the cover, and if you've got the one with a little person on it, it is um, actually the inside of a tokamak, yes. but it's turned on its side, uh, which actually always drove me nuts a little bit about this cover. Uh, but so a tokamak is a magnetic bottle for a sun, uh, for a for a plasma, and so it goes around, um, uh, confined by the magnetic fields as you heat it uh, to tens and uh, hundreds of millions of degrees Kelvin, and so hopefully you keep the pressure up and confine it tightly enough, um, you get these atoms to fuse and release more energy than you put in. That's the idea, anyhow. And there's uh, another cover. Well, it's interesting because the cover, when I click on the cover, it shows the first one shows a, a nucleus. By the way, is there a law that says whenever you're showing something to do with atomic physics, you must always show a lithium atom? It always has three electrons, Charles. What the heck? Why? Is, it, who, it's a beautiful symmetry there. Yeah. And, the, and they always have these nice orbits. I mean, that's uh, obviously, Bessel functions aren't as beautiful uh, to show on uh, 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 graphics. 
That's right. That's right. Um, so we talked, as I said, about a year ago about Hawking Hawking. I'll put links to that also in the uh, in the show notes after the video gets a little bit of loving care after after we're done. Uh, but the the subtitle has to do with with um, with the, the notion of basically hype, and I kind of um, I, I kind of thought, uh, incorporated that in the clickbait. Uh, I mean the thumbnail title uh, that I used, which has the word hype. Uh, cause, uh, I think of you as an expert on these things and, and I knew there's no one I'd rather talk to than you, um, about this. Uh, the subtitle of the, of the copy I'm looking at says the strange history of fusion and the science of wishful thinking. Tell us more, professor. Yeah, uh, this, this has kind of been a, uh, you, in, in, in all the journals, you have these terms, holy grail, uh, over and over and over again. And the idea of free energy more broadly than fusion energy has been something which has been uh, capturing the ideas of tinkerers and alchemists and uh, inventors and hoaxers since the beginning of time. And uh, only since kind of the uh, advent of thermodynamics did we know that we couldn't have a perpetual motion machine. Uh, but fusion, um, in some ways offers the next best thing, because if you convert, convert these tiny amounts of matter into energy, um, you can reveal, uh, release basically as much as you want, uh, uh, based upon the kind of the most, uh, abundant element in the universe. You can theoretically generate energy like, um, the stars do. Uh, so this has kind of been the, uh, perpetual motion machine quest for centuries um, and fusion in particular for almost a century now people thought it was around the corner for 20 years and my book was really exploring as much kind of this phenomenon of fusion as much as it was how scientists always managed to get so excited about this idea that they throw away caution to the wind and in fact throw away sometimes their scientific method in hopes of achieving this quest, and mm. which has been much, much harder than people have anticipated over the years. Yeah, the old joke was, you know, it's the energy source of the future, it always will be. Uh, <clears throat> that's been used in many, many contexts. Um, let's first talk about fusion. I'm showing uh, figure one or two, the fusion, uh, sorry, I'm showing fission, which is the generation of energy, you call it the sword of Michael. What, what does that mean? Uh, who are, yeah. What? So, so, so um, th that was kind of a play on um, Ivy Mike, and and uh, which was the first full-on hydrogen bomb test. So we entered the atomic age thanks to World War II, and um, the Manhattan Project, after kind of the Fermi uh, had a uh, critical pile in the University of Chicago, uh, was able to show that with heavy elements, with uranium. Uh, you were able to get a chain reaction of fission. Uh, and fission is where heavy elements, uh, heavier than iron and nickel, split apart. And when these heavy elements split apart, they release energy. And in the case of uranium, certain isotopes of uranium and plutonium, they also release neutrons, which strike other atoms, which split the atoms, which release more neutrons. So you get a chain reaction. So Fermi and the Manhattan Project proved that you could do this in a controlled fashion in a pile. You get enough together with a, enough moderating rods that absorb and slow neutrons. You can actually create energy by this breaking of uh, uranium fuel. Or you could do it in an uncontrolled fashion by creating a critical mass all together all of a sudden and getting an atom bomb. So that was the state of the art as of 1945. That's what helped end the war. Um, after that, though, the quest continued um, to do not just fission bombs, but fusion bombs, which, uh, unlike plutonium and uranium bombs, don't have an upper limit on how big you can build them. And for political reasons, Edward Teller wanted to have these city busting bombs rather than just the ones which would devastate downtown Hiroshima. And so the way to do that was figure out a device that used a fission bomb to generate enough x-rays to cause pressure to implode a secondary full of light elements, uh, 
uh, isotopes of hydrogen uh, to cause a fusion reaction, which was even bigger. Yeah. So the primary, which is fission, detonates, shines radiation onto the secondary, which implodes and causes a fusion reaction. And that happened in the early 1950s, first with what's called a boosted reaction, where you kind of in increase the uh, power of a fission reaction by injecting neutrons into it in a test called Greenhouse George. And the big one was Ivy Mike uh, in 1950, oh, November 1951. Mm. Um, and all of a sudden we had more energy than we could want out of a bomb, um, which is great if you're trying to destroy cities. It's not so great if you want to generate energy and put it on the grid. And so the quest began, can we take this energy and do it in a controlled way like we do with fission and uh, Fermi did in 1942. And with uh, with the, you know, kind of knowledge that stars are giant fusion reactors, I can't resist but uh, to kind of bring up somebody that is not really your favorite person to talk about, and that's, uh, that's Elon Musk. And Elon uh, has said that the quest for for nuclear fusion is basically a fool's errand. After all, we have a continuous fusion reactor uh, that happens to show up, you know, once a day, never goes on strike like my graduate students currently are. But I'm not I'm not upset about the, my graduate students uh, at the University of California. Um, I stand with them, union power. Uh, but they don't go on strike. The sun doesn't go on strike. Uh, it's available. Uh, well, not rain or shine. Uh, it's there. But um, but why go to any trouble whatsoever? Then just build more solar city, you know, Tesla power walls. Now I know that causes you trouble because you are an investor in a competitor to uh, to Elon. That's Truth Social. I and, and I know how much you no no you you become you're almost the first person in history to convince me to go to Mastodon. If I have to follow you on Mastodon, freaking Charles, you you better you better follow me back. Uh, but anyway, um, is Elon right? Are you guys making strange bedfellows? Uh, in some ways, I agree with him that that I, I do think that fusion, at least in the near term, is not going to be a practical energy source. However, I mean, I, I think that Elon is ignoring the fact that we do need good sources of energy in a practical way, short term, and solar is just not going to cut it. And I don't think solar electric is going to cut it either. Um, I think that there are other kind of solar versions that are probably more practical. But um, we can't rely entirely on renewables at this point. That's just a fact. We're, we're burning coal or burning gas or burning oil. That's because it is our needs aren't taken care of in a economically viable way, um, not just a technically viable way. So I think we do need other things out there to uh, fill in the gap. Uh, whether fusion is that answer uh, is another question. Honestly, I think fission is as many problems as it has is here now um, and has many of the same advantages that fusion does. Um, so I, the fact that um, uh, traditional fission nuclear is having so much difficulty and is so expensive relative to other forms of uh, energy is kind of a sign that uh, even if we do manage to get a uh, fusion power plant in the next 30 years, it's not going to be a panacea. It's, it's certainly economically, uh, it's got a lot to, uh, a lot of problems to overcome there. Yeah. And, you know, when you do these, um, uh, these kind of uh, deep dives into physics, uh, you do bring, a, first of all, you're an excellent writer, and I, I really enjoy that. And I think it's a rare gift that not many, you know, scientists actually have. And, and you're not practicing as a scientist, trained as a scientist. Um, but you also bring this journalistic ethos where you're really not afraid to speak truth to power. And I, I've been very much impressed by your courage and, and kind of, you know, taking on big fusion and, you know, these these other, you know, kind of national laboratories and, and really pointing out the hype. And I don't think it's to sell more copies of a book you published in 2009, uh, but but maybe, you know, there, that'll be an ancillary benefit. Uh, but I want to go through the announcement. And before we do, we're talking about uh, we're talking about Professor Charles Seif of uh, New York University, who's a two time guest on the show. First book was Hawking Hawking, which I just devoured and um, and really resonated with me because, you know, I had opportunity to meet Hawking 
once, and um, and the only interaction, uh, only aspect of that interaction I remember is that he did was asked by an audience member when he could still speak in quasi real time, why did you write a brief history of time? And as I told you last year, you know, he replied after five minutes of you know poking around with his eyes, uh, he replied because I needed to pay for my daughter's private school. Um, so at least he was honest, but but there was an industry, and there still is this mythos and ethos surrounding him that really he solved all these problems in, w in which really weren't solved, or that he was the sole contributor to many many things. Uh, it is of course a shame that he died, you know, before his colleague and friend Roger Penrose passed. 12 time guest on the show, um, you know, received the, uh, the award that, you know, rightfully maybe uh, Steve would have participated in as well. But the reason I bring this up is that, you know, he's a cherished icon. You know, there's t-shirts of him. He's as close as we've gotten to Einstein in our, in our age where you and I are the same age approximately. And so I think we grew up with that. And now we've grown up, you know, for decades, both with the, I mean, there's very few things that can solve, you know, resource wars that can prevent global, further global climate change. And if successful fusion could allow unlimited energy to not only produce energy, but to decarbonize, as I understand it, could decarbonize the planet and uh, and and reverse global warming, not just not just halt it. So you're taking on powerful forces. Um, was there any time, you know, either uh, the writing of this book maybe is is a long time before this announcement that we're about to get to. Uh, but did you ever feel like there were press uh, forces that would rather you just shut up? And that you had to use your journalistic, you know, you're like an old-fashioned newspaper man. Um, what, what, did, did you ever encounter threats? Let me, let me just be totally blunt. Did you ever feel you were threatened in any way, uh, career-wise, intellectually, or otherwise? I didn't feel a heck of a lot of pressure, except from certain fringe groups. Um, believe it or not, the uh, LaRouches, the Lyndon LaRouche backers, were very heavily into fusion. And they really disliked me to made it known and were trying kind of personally kind of sending me stuff. Um, Cold Fusion backers tended to be pretty um, angry uh, at me. But generally speaking, kind of the scientists, most of them were, even the ones on the inside were, didn't, didn't have an issue with what I was saying because they, they, they really, the good ones really admitted it that this really isn't an energy project for now, uh, which is, uh, if you push them, they will they will tell you, frankly, if you push the people at NEF uh, who um, did this uh, announcement, they will say that this is really not practical in the near term. They, they, they're going to say that they're, they're on the road to energy. This is a great step forward, even though at the same time, they'll admit that NIF is primarily a stockpile stewardship uh, project rather than energy project it really is meant for nuclear weapons. Um, <clears throat> more recently, as money has been flowing into the private sector with fusion, I've gotten more virulent opposition. Yeah. Um, but it's not it, actually the only time I've really felt more threatened is um, not when I write about physics, but write about biomed and uh, the amount of money going in there is so much greater that I don't think the physicists really have the energy to get angry with me the way the bio people do. <laughs> well, I'm reminded, uh, hearing you say that, of a quote by uh, a man whose job title, I don't think it exists anymore, Charles. Tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, it was Muckraker, and that's uh, Upton Sinclair, who said the following, Never argue with a man whose job depends on not being convinced. It's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. Um, so, you know, I don't want to, I mean, the, I think, I haven't talked to you about this, but but I assume you'll agree with this one statement, um, which is that the technology, the actual, you know, uh, the actual laboratory and scientific technology has got into this is incredibly impressive. Now, despite the vast cost of it, I mean, what is the total lifetime cost just to construct the uh, National Ignition Facility? With projects like this, it's often hard to yeah. get a good number. Um, the number I have heard brooded about for construction was about four billion. Yeah, um, it's almost double that I would say in terms of kind of lifetime costs. Yeah, um, that's something that, by the way, just parenthetically, just for my audience, is ultimately incredibly brilliant. Uh, but there may be younger people in the audience. Whenever you hear something like, "Oh, the LHC upgrade will cost three billion dollars." 
That's true. It will cost that if you're right. Usually you have to multiply by the famous fudge factor of pi, right? But that just assumes you want to build it to just gaze at it, you know. But but if you actually want to use the darn thing, it costs about rule of thumb from the Department of Energy for my friends that work there. It's about 10% of the construction cost per year to operate said instrument. And it, it's kind of scale invariant uh, across all different fields, including cosmology. Uh, so my $100 million Simons Observatory that I get to be uh, PI with and, and lead with my friends at Princeton and Penn and Berkeley, this incredible project, and Chicago, this project is going to cost twice that, you know, $200 million over a decade. Um, it's just astounding how much these things cost. So um, it, uh, just notwithstanding or normalizing out the technology or the, the, the money, I think the technology is, is rather interesting. And I think there are two different forms of, of, of plasma that are promising on Earth. One is, um, one is called inertial confinement, which we'll talk about. Uh, but the other is called uh, is um, called magnetic confinement or, or alternate confinement, uh, and that's to solve this 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 triple product. And maybe you can kind of explain what is the physics behind what it actually has to come together, literally. Uh, and in this case, we'll just stick to deuterium and, and tritium and, and the 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 the, the uh, components of this fusion reaction at the National Ignition Facility. What needs to be achieved, and what have they actually claimed to achieve? Yeah. So so. To get fusion, you need um, a, a reasonable amount of energy out. You need high temperatures and pressure, and you need a reasonable amount of confinement time. That these things work against each other, and getting all three simultaneously is very difficult. Which is why you have so many records saying we have the highest temperature ever in a tokamak, or we've confined for twelve hundred seconds in a tokamak, but they don't talk about the other factors that you need to kind of get all uh, fusion going. So um, ICF, the inertial confinement fusion, which NIF is doing, uh, uses external factors like lasers to compress something. Magnetic confinement, which ITER, the big project in France, uh, is using, uh, uses large magnets, generally in a donut-shaped um, conf uh, configuration to confine and heat the plasmas. So um, two kind of separate branches. NIF is inertial confinement, uses uh, lasers, which are these basically a building uh, sized laser bank, which uh, has these incredible, I mean, this is, this is amazing stuff, um, uh, doped glass amplifiers which, with two megajoule capacitors in all through the room. Uh, these, these capacitors hold so much energy that they regularly explode and they have to be armored so that the, they spray shrapnel in places that, that won't hurt people. Um, so um, amazing technology. They take these lasers, uh, 192 beams worth, that bounce, kind of go um, back and forth like lasers do, picking up energy, um, then get uh, their, their frequency tripled. Um, it has to be very, very high uh, frequency. And then shined into a... Um, a, a little sleeve, a gold sleeve called a whole rod. And this is very much like what happens in the secondary of a hydrogen bomb. Um, the lasers get converted to x-rays and you have this radiation floating about. The radiation pressure uh, uh, is focused upon a tiny little BB sized pellet full of hydrogen uh, isotopes. Yeah, and, and just, Charles, sorry to interrupt, but I'm showing this um, the image gallery that you forwarded to me, and I'll put that in the show notes. If you're listening to this on an audio podcast, I'm now just showing um, some slides and images from uh, lasers.llnl.gov, and I will uh, link to those in the show notes as well. Um, so I'm showing the BB now, the whole ROM. Um, so what does Holoram stand for, or what does it mean? Is it some? It's the German German term for. Uh... I guess uh, some I, I I don't speak German. It's a reflection room, a hole, a, a room with a hole in it. Um, ah. I'm not exactly sure, but okay. it is the it is the term that was used uh, to describe this, and um, that's not the it, that's the target of the lasers. But the real ultimate target is that pellet. Yes, and so that X rays shine on the pellet. The um, pellet begins to ablate and uh, shoot stuff off, and you get the jet effect, and everything just compresses. And if you do it right, you get enough pressure, uh, enough temperature, just through the compression heating and through the heating of the plasma, um, 
to get a small fusion reaction. And of course, it blows itself apart very quickly. So you have to have enough uh, oomph to get more out than in. So the announcement uh, last week was the first defensible announcement, I would say, in either the magnetic or inertial conf confinement fusion sectors to get more energy out than in. And that comes with a big asterisk. Yeah. But um, the big asterisk is that the way they define more out than in in this context is more energy of laser uh, of fusion out than laser light in. Now, the problem with that is lasers are inefficient um, and it takes 100 times more energy to generate the beams than it takes to um, uh, to then then comes out shining. So mm -hmm. even if you have that break even uh, on the laser side, there's still a huge drain of energy there on the uh, between the wall plug and the lasers mm -hmm. um, that aren't accounted for. So whether that is really break even, well, it's 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 a definition that scientists agreed upon in the late 70s, early 80s. So it is a milestone. This is I, I don't want to diminish that. But in terms of real but is, world given that, effect, I'm sorry to interrupt again, Charles, but is that really, I mean, wait, you described a fusion device, a bomb, um, you know, isn't it true that the net, you know, uh, production of energy, just raw energy, heat from, you know, the fat man or whatever the, uh, the first fusion devices were, they had some amount of input from a fission device that was lower than what was liberated. So it, I mean, tech, this wasn't sustained. This isn't connected to, you know, SDG and E here in San Diego and generating electricity. So is that really true? Uh, I mean, it, in, in the lab, in a controlled manner, you're absolutely right that uh, if you wanted, you could have an underground cavern, a salt cavern, and you detonate fusion devices and boil steam. In fact, yeah. <laughs> uh, John Knuckles, who is the architect of this whole ICF thing, was actually investigating as part of Project Plowshare the idea of generating energy by detonating uh, hydrogen bombs. It just didn't make sense uh, mm. to do it. But uh, you're absolutely right. That I mean, you could, uh, that is an energy source, a net energy source infusion. That was done in the 50s. Yeah. And I was talking to some friends over uh, uh, Shabbat this past weekend. They're all asking me about the, um, you know, this big breakthrough and how interesting it is. And it is interesting. Like I said, technologically, the, the experimental physicist in me, you know, is delighted and, and mesmerized by it. On the other hand, you know, it is, and this is, again, where your journalistic expertise positions you in a role that's unique in the world. I have to say, not with, uh, you know, un, untold flattery, you know, to get you to follow me on Mastodon. But, um, <laughs> but, but, the, but the point being, I, I made the analogy, it's kind of like, you know, you're using, like, your friend Elon's, you know, magic uh, dragon you know, rocket or falcon rocket, and on the side of it is a match. And, and it goes up and as it launches it, it rubs against a piece of, you know, of, of sandpaper igniting the match. And OK, so, well, like the actual motion, that wasn't that wasn't so much energy to get a more, more, little bit more heat. Um, but there's you had to build a rocket. You had to put in all the energy to, to make this device. It's not sustainable. It's not it doesn't seem to be like a technological path forward. So is it just, you know, quote unquote, and again, this is with incredible respect and admiration for these colleagues doing the hardest job, you know, and the most rewarding job in this sense, uh, the experimentalist. Um, but uh, is it is it a evolutionary dead end? Is, is there a prospect for for this to actually any inertial confinement, this one or another, to provide sustainable power in the um, you know foreseeable future? From a power point of view, I do think that this is a dead end. Yeah. Um, at least certain certainly this technology that NIF has done. I mean, the flash lamps are unbelievable. However, you've got a room full of glass that takes a third of a day to cool down. And 2.1 megajoules, or, or I guess they created 3.5 megajoules out. That's about what you get by tossing a piece of kindling in the fire, which is all very nice and good, but isn't powering much. Right. So really, really for a, a, a reasonable ICF power plant, you've got to have a repeat rate in the tens of hertz. So uh thousands of times a day tens of thousands of times a day hundreds of thousands of times a day so um you've got to go to totally different technology probably solid state lasers and you have to have solid state lasers and very high frequencies and so there's so many kind of technical barriers that haven't been worked out that this is 
really not a proof of principle of anything on the ICF path to power, I would say. Mm. Um, what is it really? I mean, it's, I mean, I think it's significant for NIF because that was its design goal. And to have a $4 billion project that 12 years after it turned on was unable to achieve its design goal uh, would be a major black eye for uh, Livermore. And so the, the fact that they finally lived up to, it's not the national threshold of ignition facility anymore, um, <laughs> is, is, is a major deal for them. Um, what it means for us, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's in terms of stockpile stewardship, um, they are in a new regime. And I, I, I'm hoping that they'll be able to increase their gain significantly over the next few months and years that they're in a regime where you're actually getting significant heating from fusion, which is new, but for energy, not really. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. afraid it's not, a, not helping much. What is the next goal of their research? Is it to just improve the Q or the amplification factor, which um, you, you, you've you know, characterized about 50% energy net gain, or that's their characterization of it. What, what is there? Are they just going to try to increase that? Again, just shouldn't be demeaning, guys. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not diminishing it at all. But is that the main, you know, technology kind of, um, you know, forking point that they're going to pursue? Or are they going to, you know, add uh, doubling the lasers and, you know, doing something? Or, you know, going to gamma rays instead of X? Is there some technological hurdle? Or is it more and better of the same? It's more and better of the same, although they, they are definitely, they've got this huge parameter space to fool around with. And mm. they're tweaking all sorts of things, not just the aim of the lasers, the power of the lasers, the thickness of the ablator, the kind of the thinness of the shell, the fills of the shell, uh, whether you put a magnetic field around it, whether you not, don't put a magnetic field around it. There, so there's lots and lots of things that they play around with. And part of the issue is that a lot of these experiments are not very well reproducible, that there's a huge sensitivity to initial conditions. So um, part of the reason that this um, device was created in the first place is to experiment throughout parameter space and figure out so they can simulate um, uh, implosions better, which is useful for weapons design and uh, stockpile stewardship. So what they're really doing is trying to figure out how to get things, what, what parameters are really sensitive, what parameters really aren't, where are the simulations failing, where are they not? Um, so they've got a lot of science to do, not in the energy domain as much as it is in kind of understanding this liminal space, which is really kind of interesting physically and interesting for weapons, just not for energy. I'm showing now some of the videos from uh, Secretary Granholm's visit there last week on the 13th. Um, you know, showing some of the the swag that they gave out and the threshold uh, um, uh, and going beyond the threshold. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the the um, you know kind of downstream effects. Uh, 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 you know, when I think about you know energy and uh, and fusion, obviously you can't not think about you know weapons at, at some level. And I'm wondering, you know, is there kind of a potential beating of, uh, of swords into plowshares moment where we see that we have fought many resource wars around the world? And in fact, there's this thing called the resource curse, you know, which you, you've heard about probably, but, you know, just loosely explained is the countries that have the most, you know, diamonds or oil and stuff, they often have the least tolerant, least democratic regimes and least open, at least, to journalistic freedoms and all sorts of other things um, from, uh, you know, time immemorial. Now, what if, you know, the U.S. becomes the world's leader in, in generating fusion energy? Would that happen to us? You know, would we, would the U.S. become a giant, you know, South Africa, uh, De Beers? Uh, what are the implications of this, just from a geopolitical standpoint, if you would? Well, I mean, if, if one were to create fusion energy, I mean, it's, uh, for there to be this, uh, resource curse, there would have to be some sort of moat to prevent others from coming across. Just like with nuclear weapons, once someone proved it was able to be done, it wasn't all that hard for others to reproduce uh, the issue. So I, 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 unless there's some sort of secret sauce, which is patentable, or, or, or there's some very difficult technical fix that we keep top secret, I, it's hard for me to imagine that there would be this 
um, it would become the domain of one country. Uh, I, I would assume that Europe and China and other places with the technical abilities would follow on fairly quickly. So I, I don't see a resource curse, even if we get this working. Which I, again, I, I, I don't see it happening. I, I think that the magnetic branch is more likely than the um, uh, inertial branch. Uh, it happens to be less useful for uh, weapons research, which is part of the reason why it's much more international. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And, and speaking of weapons, you know, I've thought, and this is just more of a sidetrack because I don't get to talk to you that often, but, um, you know, when you think about, you know, I was thinking recently, you know, this geopolitical situation that the world has been suffering through since February 26th or whatever, whenever Putin invaded Ukraine, you know, lingering and looming over that conversation has been this, this dreadful thought of nuclear war and uh, even some claiming we're already in you know, World War Three, and it's just a matter of time before a, d a device is detonated. Um, and some, including my friend Eric Weinstein, I'm not going to uh, d dwell on, um, uh, you know, some of the claims that he's made, but at least on his podcast, he called for the resumption of atmospheric nuclear above ground testing um, as a warning to society to kind of illustrate the horrors of it. Um, I don't want to talk about Eric's. Uh, hopefully he's coming on the podcast back on the podcast at some point soon to talk about that and many other things. But I want to ask you, um, you know, I was thinking, you know, about the Holocaust recently and and thinking about well, you know, how visceral it is. And except for the in insanity of, you know, Kanye West. By the way, do we have to do journalists have to call him? Yay. I mean, like, who is this guy? Like, you have to call him by his preferred new name because it's he chose it. But he could, anyway, I don't want to get into that. Point is, um, when we look at uh, when we think about, you know, what could have what could happen uh, what did happen during the Holocaust, one of the most, you know, kind of poignant outcomes of it has been the portrayal of it in society and the awareness of it uh, and how and how awful and doc and, and well documented it was, in fact. Uh, things from the Butterfly Project started here in San Diego, documenting 1.5 million uh, Jewish children exterminated, all the way up Schindler's List, obviously, the Holocaust Museum. Anyway, do we need some sort of, like, nuclear Holocaust museum? I and mean, do we have any... Uh, equivalent or would it be useful to kind of just just really relate to humanity how horrific and and awful any kind of you know i love well nuclear war is winnable no it's not <laughs> i mean yeah okay you could say tactically whatever the russians have some plans but anyway charles do we need some kind of education you know kind of tantamount and i'm not asking to speculate on the morality of of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki device, I happen to think that they were, but but let's not get into that. But do we need education about the horrors of it? And could these technologies that we're now talking about, could they be a tool to educate the public? Well, yeah, I mean, you and I, you and I grew up in a moment when we couldn't forget about nuclear weapons. I mean, yeah. uh, Cold War was hot, and um, we heard about the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. We didn't hear about uh, Abel Archer. Uh, in 1983, um, but we know about it now. And I think that it, it, it does seem a little remote to us in a way that sounds, that feels dangerous. Um, mm -hmm. I wish we did have a little bit more understanding of the horrors of these, these weapons. And I think part of it is, I mean, we are uh, hamstrung partially by the fact that of nations in the world who have used these weapons in anger, we are the only ones. Um, so I think that it doesn't dwell in our psyche in the way that it does, say, for the Japanese. Um, I think it is a bad thing that, I mean, I, similarly with, I think with the, uh, as the Holocaust survivors, the last ones die out, that we as a society are in danger of losing our historical memory. Um, so, and I, I, I I would be in favor of anything we can do to kind of get uh, get an immediacy to our kids to understand that this is part of what they have to live with, even if they don't see it. Yeah, I think that's um, you know that's kind of uh, the obligation of an educator is to is to really you know bring these things home, but but in a way that um, you know is is done in a controlled fashion, but also is 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 visceral. I mean, we know from being educators. Uh, although I don't know, I, I was never taught it. I, I learned it on the job, but uh, but you know the most the most vivid and permanent demonstrations uh, are those in you know that adhere to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, including 
you know, the, the removal of threats against safety and then conversely, I suppose that if you really visualized how awful something could be, you'd be less likely to employ it. So uh, I know we only have a few minutes before I have to go light my Hanukkah candles using my fusion reactor. You can see it behind me in the background. I actually did a video recently about heavy water using deuterium uh, to make ice cubes uh, that uh, that sink instead of float. And that was really fun. Um, but uh, but I, I guess the, the, the last question I, I wanted to kind of delve into is, you know, where 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 would you like to see this go? If you were, you know, um, you know, not uh, not I don't want to say some eccentric billionaire, but could you could you think of a way uh, that you would like to see this going with not unlimited resources, but, you know, billions of dollars, private sector, public sector? Where do you see it? Well, I'd, I'd love to see kind of a. a, a a reasonable coherent plan of when we can respectively get this on the grid in a solution um and i i right now i, I mean we we haven't had a kitty hawk moment where you get wings off the ground so it's uh honestly i think it belongs as part of the larger portfolio uh, of dealing uh, how we are going to deal with climate change in the next five years 10 years 20 years and that includes a portfolio of um technologies that are here now, uh, technologies that are a bit of a stretch, and that's not just on the uh, supply side, but on, on demand side, as well as kind of geoengineering. I mean, we've got to open those discussions, um, as sad as it is. So um, I, want, I want Fusion to take its place within the larger portfolio, rather than kind of being a techno fix uh, that seems to solve everything. I mean, there's there's an old story, um, and I, I'm not sure whether it's true or not. But it was it was I think it was uh, told by I think I think it was Martin Luther King, but I, uh, the, uh, a a a um, person on death row, um, kind of marching towards death row. He's he's muttering under his breath, "Save me, Joe Lewis! Save me, Joe Lewis!" Uh, I mean, for me, kind of clutching at fusion as this technological save all is as futile as kind of having their hero step in and kind of magically whisk you away from death row. We've got to really work on, on practical solutions. And while fusion may be there in 30 years, uh, mm. we need something sooner. Great. Um, so there's a couple of questions and folks that are online on YouTube, you can ask a couple more questions. Uh, there's some debate back and forth, whether or not we could ever ramp up tritium production. Uh, substantially. So I couldn't make a tritium heavy water ice cube uh, for a variety of reasons. One is it's radioactive, uh, but the other it's a controlled and it's a very expensive. Uh, is tritium a bottleneck? Uh, and then just to remind my audience, you can ask more questions for a couple more minutes. Yeah, it's, it's a bottleneck now um, because we have a limited supply. But once you have neutrons, you can kind of generate tritium to some extent, especially when you have uh, uh, adequate uh, supplies of lithium. Um, so I'm less worried about kind of the the materials part, the fuel, than I am about the, uh, the process itself. Mm -hmm. And then uh, so there's a question, how much energy would be used, if you could do this, I suppose, to split water into hydrogen and deuterium? I guess the question would be, you know, could you attach your fusion reactor, you know, energy source coming out, the back end, then then put it into a centrifuge. You know, it's just a series of centrifuges. What what is the potential? I mean, desalination of the ocean, uh, scrubbing the atmosphere of carbon dioxide. Uh, do you think these will ever come true? Uh, are, are these things that will that will likely materialize, or, or not really? A good question. I mean, I, I the first the first thing that comes to mind is desalinization. If you have infinite energy, desalinization and you know, carbon scrubbing and things like that. My big question is, can civilization hold on long enough until we get to the point where we can get there? Um, and also, honestly, I, I wonder whether we have a society that would allow um, kind of uh, a free energy solution or whether we kind of always have commercial barriers uh, to kind of this, this paradise that people see. I and mean, it's, like, it's not like Star Trek where we can all drop uh, the idea of money and we can uh, get Earl Grey tea just by pure energy. Um, of course, it's theoretically there, but I, I, yeah. the way we humans behave, I, I, I think scarcity is built into our bones, and I, I'm, I'm not sure we'd let go of it so quickly.
Yeah, that might be. Um, so let's see, thorium reactors. Talk about thorium reactors, Charles. Any interest that you have there from uh, this? From yeah. This is from a golem. We've got Mitzvah's golem in the in the house tonight. Hi, Mitzvah's Hawks and Mayak. Um, what do you think about thorium as a, a thorium fuel sodium cooled reactor? I think advanced fuel cycle reactors are really, really interesting. I think pebble bed reactors, I think even kind of traditional kind of uh, uranium, low enriched uranium with advanced designs, I think those are worth exploring and worth doing something, uh, especially since they're, the, uh, they're nearer term than, than uh, fusion is. So again, I think, I think it fits very nicely into that niche um, that fusion occupies, but because fusion is so beautiful an idea, it's kind of crowded out everything because it's, it seems like the ideal techno fix uh, when there's stuff like this out there that's probably mm -hmm. not right. And then the last question uh, I'm going to ask using my host prerogative, um, totally pivoting now, the state of journalism today. So we've seen journalism kind of assailed from many different angles. Uh, we've seen, you know, posts and, and accusations, uh, you know, from places like journalists on on Twitter complaining about Twitter, as I, you know, tweeted the other day. You know, Twitter sucks. He tweeted, you know, and <laughs> and I know you you have, you know, kind of found it much less hospitable. Uh, I've tried to set up Mastodon. I've been banned from Truth Social. Uh, what what does the landscape look? Like? What are you teaching your students? What what are they um, what do they feel about this pr pr uh, profession that they've uh, you know Admit, admittedly tried to become a part of there's a lag in time between what they wanted to do four years ago and maybe the way things are now so talk about the landscape talk about your um uh, your how, how you're dealing with all these you know radical changes on a daily mm -hmm. basis depending on how much diet coke uh, certain south african uh, billionaires had yeah no no it's it may live in interesting times uh yeah it's it's, it's... It's kind of the culmination of uh, of a lot of things that have been rocking journalism for the past twenty years, because and we were talking about scarcity, that the digital environment may, it creates post scarcity for uh, information uh, technology that you you can you no longer have to have a physical paper or a uh, delivered uh, it's uh, can be copied indefinitely without without anyone paying, so that kind of broke the journalism model and we've kind of been writing from fad to fad, um, trying to figure out how to make money despite the fact that um, our, our chief um, uh, asset was an audience that we could sell things to. And other people have basically been able to duplicate that and we can no longer sell for uh, a subscription model very easily. Um, Twitter, uh, happened to be a niche where um, we as an industry did not kind of come up with a good infrastructure where we could disseminate our work uh, in a smart way. So we kind of have been piggybacking to our uh, mistake, I think, uh, on Facebook and on Twitter. And we learned very quickly how hostile uh, Facebook was. It took a little longer to figure out how hostile Twitter is. So I, I, I mean, I think that this is a reckoning that's been happening in slow motion for 20 years. And I don't think that it's over by any stretch. I don't think Mastodon is an answer. I don't think Post is an answer. Um, we have to figure out how to maintain our audiences, maintain the trust in the audiences, even as our audiences get more uh, schismatic, which is really really hard it's hard to do a broadcast when the audience is in two different places we can't capture capture everyone we want no absolutely all right well charles uh i want to thank you so much professor charles Seif, new york university the best university one of the best universities in the world uh and uh and and our true a true thought leader someone who has a old-fashioned newspaper man's you know i know you've got one of those tweed hats in addition you know with the, with the card says press and, and and you break that out with your tweed jacket as a professor i want to remind you if you are interested in getting exotic materials uh shipped to you uh won't make it in time for hanukkah or christmas but these are uh fragments of a meteorite highly magnetized meteorite uh, that landed some four billion years ago in the americas and in, in argentina uh, join my mailing list. I have a link up there, briankeating.com slash list. 
Uh, please leave a, a review wherever you're watching this. Thumbs up if you like this. If you'd like to see some more um, uh, videos with, with Charles, I can read more of his books. Uh, he's got an, another phenomenal book called Zero, uh, which is about the dangerous idea of zero. We've had on uh, uh, Charles twice now. Maybe he'll come back for a third time. But let me know what you thought of this episode. And if you'd like to see more of these live conversations with thought leaders and uh, and truly a generous um, a generous scholars. I think of you when I think about a, what should a scholar be. Uh, it's somebody like you, Charles. So I want to thank you so much. Wish you a happy holiday season. Happy New Year. And I hope we can talk next year. And may we have nuclear feud. May we have, uh, you know, thousands of flowers blooming without any booms. Right, Charles? Hopefully. And um, thank you very much. And Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Happy Hanukkah. Merry Christmas to my other listeners out there. And uh, Happy New Year. And we've got a couple more episodes to come. Today we had Edward Frankel on. Uh, and uh, next week we're going to have on Stacy McGaw talking about uh, Mond, alternatives to dark matter, big dark matter. You know, there's anti-dark matter, there's pro-dark matter. Uh, maybe we'll use that to run a super fusion reactor. So I don't know. I'm just making it up. Uh, we'll have on a couple more UFO episodes and, and possibly one uh, more before the end of the year. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Good night. Bye, Charles. Good night. Thank you.